Hi, my name is Kareem Tapsh and I'm the co-founder and co-director of O Cinema. We're delighted to once again be welcoming you to Art Films, our exciting series by, for, and about artists and the visual arts. Uh, what a thrill it is to once again collaborate with our good friends at Oolite Arts in this presentation. You know, it's been about a year since the pandemic started and uh, everything that was once happening in person uh, now happens through our screens. Uh, we're so proud that we've been able to seamlessly transfer this thrilling program that we we're also excited for with every new addition to a virtual programming space and be able to connect with you on a continued basis. Uh, we are really excited and I'm personally really thrilled about sharing this film Museum Town with you. It's a film that talks about the importance of art in our communities and in our lives and how it can be transformative to cities and spaces. And while that might be true for West Adam, Massachusetts, where this film takes place, it's a message that resonates with our work at O Cinema and at Oolite right here in Miami. I hope you really enjoy the film. Uh, again, this partnership and collaboration with Oolite is one of our favorite events that we host throughout the year. Uh, another favorite thing that's happening is that O Cinema is reopening its doors after almost a year's long closure. We are very much looking forward to welcoming you back into our space, South Beach at Old City Hall very soon. If you don't already subscribe to our e-newsletter, please do that by visiting www.o-cinema.org for our updates on our virtual programming and the reopening of our physical space. Thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the film. Well, Danielle, am I good to go? We're good to go. Okay, thanks. Hey everybody, it's Dennis Scholl here, President and CEO of Oolite Arts. Uh, I am loving art films tonight. This is just one of those great films that reminds us that there are so many cool and interesting films by and about artists out there. We've shown some great ones. We've had Kusama, we've had Hilma Off Klint, we've had Richard Hamilton. Tom, you remember Richard Hamilton? Oh my. You know, we, we just had such a great group of, 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 of art films over the last few years, and uh, there's more to come. But tonight, I am joined by the director of Museum Town, Jennifer Trainer, and Tom Krenz, whose idea Mass Mocha actually was. And I got to lead with full disclosure, Tom also led the Guggenheim for many years and gave me my very first national patronage opportunity when he and Nancy Spector asked Deborah and me to chair their new photography committee many, many, many years ago. And so he kind of launched me on this philanthropy kick and I am forever indebted to him for that. It has been a important and joyful uh, time in my life doing it. So uh, Tom, I, I really, I can, never, I can never thank you enough for that, frankly. So- I, I followed your career and it was a great move on our part. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a career, but uh, so everybody send me your questions in the chat. We really want your questions tonight, but I'm going to start with Jennifer first. Jennifer, uh, I'm kind of an emerging filmmaker, even with all the gray hair and everything. I've only been at it about 10 years, but I want to tell folks, this is your directorial debut. And the first thing everybody wants to know is what caused you to go from not ever making a film to choosing this one? What really compelled you? about this that brought you to the table? Because making these films is really hard. Well, I think that a number of people thought I was pretty foolish <laughs> to attempt my first film. And the question always was, so whatever, what other films have you made? <laughs> and I, my answer was, everybody has to make a first. Everybody has a first of everything. And I felt, you know, watching Mass Mocha develop and being there for 28 years, I felt like I was witnessing something really extraordinary. And when you think about, you think about places that have always been there, right? Yankee Stadium, the Museum of Modern Art, um, the Smithsonian. And nobody thinks about, there was an idea that somebody had, and then there was all the sweat equity to actually realize that. And I felt truly privileged to be there for that sweat equity. So it was a story I wanted to tell. Well, I, I don't think I got out of the film that you were there actually 28 years. That's extraordinary. 
and you know, we're going to come back in a minute to you being a maker and a protagonist in the film. I think, I think that's a really difficult thing to talk about. But first, I want to say, Tom, you were there at the beginning. Your, bear, your board chair, Sandy, said you were too big for the Williams College Museum. And I agree, and I think that your incredible career has, of course, proven that to be true. But you've always pushed the envelope in your approach. And walking into the mill for the first time or the second time or the third time, was it the space that, that trumped everything when you saw that vast expanse of potential exhibition space? Was that the moment for you, or what was the moment? Well, actually, it's a, it's a good question. I can be very specific about the epiphany. Um, the epiphany was on the uh, 14th of November in 1985. And uh, I was driving back from Cologne where I'd been at the art fair to Frankfurt. And at the Cologne art fair, two um, dealers who were not in business long enough to be able to rent space in the fair um, rented a factory building, a, a basically an abandoned factory building next to the art fair. And they showed these gigantic paintings by Marcus Lupertz, um, lit with uh, floodlights. Um, the place was not cleaned up. It was not heated. Uh, it was not a museum space. And uh, as I was driving back uh, to, to Frankfurt to come back to the US, I saw you know, driving through the Ruhr Valley, you see all of these uh, factory buildings. And the factory buildings, it was, it was like a bingo moment. North Adams had nothing but factory buildings <laughs> that were, were not used. And as it happened at that time, I was the, the director of the, the, the Williams College Museum. And uh, the second you know, epiphany that piled on top of that was uh, Ellsworth Kelly's studio was nearby uh, in, I think it was, was Spencertown or Steventown? Um, Spencertown, I believe. And uh, I knew Ellsworth by that time. And uh, he had built a, a huge studio space that he'd essentially installed like a museum. I mean, there was, the, there was a section of it in a different room where he worked. But if you went into that space, you saw something like 30 paintings installed by a single artist. And you juxtapose that, I mean, my experience at that time was essentially the Museum of Modern Art. And if you wanted to see an Ellsworth Kelly work, you could go to the Museum of Modern Art and you'd see one, maybe. <laughs> but the idea of organizing, taking advantage of this space um, organizing a museum that perhaps would um, show, as right now at Mass Mocha, there are 105 uh, Saul LeWitt works up at one time for 25 years. And uh, that's a fundamentally different experience of the work of art. It's not this 18th century idea of the encyclopedia, uh, one of everything, but rather an opportunity to be uh, selective um, and to see artists in depth. So those two thoughts, the, uh, the fact that factories could become art museums and Mass Mocha, the building, formerly Sprague Electric, it was a million square feet in 28 buildings. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, the idea of um, the Saul Lewitz, for example, for me is like the slow food movement. I mean, it's a completely different way of consumption and it's such a joyful way. And I, I could literally go there four times a year for the next 25 years and be a happy person and have an art experience that's very special. Um, uh, Jennifer, even though the town was really not a, a place that you would expect for something like this to happen, um, it eventually did happen, but when you guys were getting it rolling, how big a concern was that to you? I mean, the political part of the film is very extensive and you must have lived and died about a hundred times. Yeah, yeah, we, we did. We absolutely did. And um, Mayor Barrett made a very good point in the film when he said that when Tom came to him and talked about this, you know, the idea of art as economic development was not on anybody's radar. And one of the things I wanted to show in the film is that it wasn't a layup. You know, now art is talked about a lot as a vehicle for economic development. And certainly there are many cities. And as I've done the film festivals around the country, you know, people have asked like, 
how does it work? And one thing I wanted to show that it was a combination of, of uh, I think the brilliance of the idea and the location that it wasn't too close to New York, but it wasn't too far away. And then it was a lot of kismet. I mean, what, you know, what you see in the film. I mean, I remember so distinctly the Worcester Telegram ran an editorial that said, just go away. <laughs> and that was the sentiment. And, you know, somebody in the Q&A asked, you know, what kept us going? It's like, there was never a moment when you could just say, okay, let's turn off the lights and go home and forget the idea. Yeah. You know, when I met, I met Tom at a cocktail party at the Williams College of Mu Museum of Art and Tom, forgive me for saying this, but talking to you was a little bit like walking into a wind tunnel. You know, it was like, whoa. And he had this outrageous idea. You know, contemporary art was less popular than camel wrestling in New England in 1987. That's and, a pretty low bar. Yeah. And it was just, it was so preposterous. It was a beautiful idea that had a, you know, had a, a chance in hell of happening, but it didn't. Yeah, I, I wonder though, and I ask this question to both of you, um, it didn't appear in the film that even at this point in time with, with Mass Mocha being North Adams, that the current interviews that you did, the town folks, it's not like they all agree. Like in Miami, you can't get anybody to say a bad word about Art Basel. It's kind of put us yeah. on the map it's allowed us to evolve in a different way. We're obviously a larger urban area, but I didn't get, am I reading it right that the townspeople still to this day, there's lots of them who think, you know, not for me and not that interested. Yeah, that was actually a revelation in making the film. I remember one day we were filming on the main street and a guy came up to us and he was really angry. And he said, you know, when I worked in the factory, there were you know, it was a, it was a town, it was a company town. They had a company orchestra, a company daycare, a company newsletter, 4,000 people worked in this town of 12,000 people. And so they, many townspeople would have been just as happy to have another factory or even a jail. I mean, many, many things were proposed. And so it was much more complicated once I got outside the gates and started to look at it as a filmmaker. And we wanted to show that because I, I didn't want to create a PR piece. I wanted to show how, how textured and complicated these kinds of, of brave leaps are. Yeah. Tom, you've done this a couple of times, a few times now. Um, is there a point at which everybody gets with the program or are there always people who say, I wish it was still, or like there's one lady in the film that says, we ought to bring in another factory. And my question is who's we? And you know, how do you deal with people, places like China and these other places where all that you know, manufacturing went away? Do you feel that Tom in the community still? I, I you know, it's, it's a slow transformation. Um, you know, change uh, happens, but, but rarely is it, is it instantaneous. I mean, the, perhaps the closest to instantaneous that you might, um, that I might have experienced was the Guggenheim and Bilbao, but that was a, almost a black and white thing. I remember in, the, in the, uh, the, the three or four or five years that we were developing the project, um, there were various uh, surveys in the press that 20% of the people were in favor of the museum. I mean, it got involved in the, the, black, the Basque political uh, yeah. contest with Spain. I remember um, that. And I, afterward, once um, <laughs> a million and a half people were coming every year uh, and it transformed the local economy, I think the numbers completely flipped. 80% um, were in favor and 20% were not. And it's hard to say exactly what um, you know, where that transition takes place. I mean, I, the, Bill Bow is known for this, this huge 45 foot uh, Jeff Koons sculpture, flower sculpture of a puppy dog. Yeah. If you talked to people prior to the installation of that work, prior to 1997, they would have said, uh, that is the craziest idea. I'm not in favor of it, of, of a sculpture made of flowers, but I will tell you there is not a christening or a wedding that takes place in the Bath country that doesn't 
feature a photograph in front of the Jepson's flower. Absolutely. So the degree to which it's been embraced by the community, it just takes time. I, I think you, you, uh, you can't deny the fact that, um, that Mass Mocha uh, is an extraordinary place. And it's also an extraordinary place by this, as Jennifer refers to this, almost this gigantic communal effort. I mean, the number of people that you couldn't make a list long enough to, to, to uh, acknowledge everybody who had a role in it. But Mass Mocha is, is an extraordinary thing. And that ultimately affects the people who live there. I mean, whether they go there or not, you know, that's a different thing. And it may I'm, not take sure, I'm not so sure that's as important as the way it affects the people that live there. I think you're right. But there's no doubt that economic impact um, has become a kind of uh, a, a, a standard reference. Uh, and, and Mass Mocha was one of the first places. And the reason we did the economic impact was because we needed state funding to get this moving forward. And um, the North Adams had just lost 5,000 jobs. So we didn't write about how great the art was, or we didn't write about the revolutionary ideas, but in our discussions and negotiations with the governor and the state legislature, um, what was emphasized was that this was going to create jobs. And, and that's all um, they want to hear really. So Jennifer, did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, yeah, I think that's true. You know, the, the money from the state did not come out of the Arts Council. Right. It came out of the, the funding that, you know, supports bridges and tunnels. And Tom's absolutely right. You know, the governor said to us, show, show that there's support. And we raised a million dollars in pledges. And they said, well, that's interesting. Now, now raise some serious money. And he sent us back to raise eight million. And the way that we did it was by going to the cobbler and saying, you know, 70% of the people here are out of work and nobody's getting their shoes done. What if we had 100,000 visitors? You know, what kind of business would you do? And would you pledge that over four years only if the state says yes? And so it was, it was truly, you know, the, the initial supporters were not art collectors. They weren't people from New York and the art world. They were the businesses of the region. Yeah. And so I think also going back to the point of, you know, it's not so important whether people go there, it's that a lot of people feel that they own it because they helped bring it into being. Sure. It's, it's getting that buy-in is getting yeah. that buy-in huge. Jennifer, I gotta know as a nerdy filmmaker myself, how did you get the rights to all that amazing music? Wilco, David Byrne, I mean, come on. Oh, you know, I wanted, I wanted to make a film that had great music and I didn't want like a rock doc, but I, that was really important to me, partly because those are the kinds of films I like. Like I really wanted people sort of bouncing in their seats and also because half of Mass Mocha is performing arts. So I approached John Sturrett, who's a guitarist for Wilco and, um, and he loved the idea. And then I approached David Byrne. And then, you know, once you get one or two people to sign on, others do too. And I would say that um, we have a website called, uh, <laughs> I think it's called museumtownmovie.org or something like that. People can Google it. And our Spotify playlist is on it. And the opening song is by Big Thief. And it's, the soundtrack is so amazing. Yeah. of people who either uh, have performed at Mass Mocha or, or, or represent the kind of mood that we are trying to convey. My biggest emotion was jealousy, be, to be honest, because I've played <laughs> a bunch of films and always want better music and it's very expensive and people, you know, but yeah. I was thinking to myself, I always shout out to my wife, Deborah, I say, how did she get that music? I'm always like, ah. So yeah, and uh, the, know, last, really the last song is by Lucius, Will the Woman by Lucius. Yeah, it's, um, I thank you for saying that because I love the soundtrack. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Yeah. So, so Tom, when you left and you guys were facing the, I love the Berkshire boondoggle, one of my favorite lines in the film. Um, when you left Jennifer and Joe to, you know, you got the dream gig of what, what I would think of as the dream gig at the Guggenheim and you made the most of it, obviously. Did you still believe at that time the project was possible or, or was part of the lack of being stuck at that point in time, the lack of success, was that a, a part of the reason you might've gone, gone forward? 
Well, I, I don't, you know, there's, this took place now 30 years ago. I mean, my recollection of this was that the state had committed uh, $35 million in a, um, um, in a match. And so where do you start with the match? Yes, you start to raise money, but the first was to get control of the buildings. And ultimately we went through a very complicated process of, um, we bought it, I think it was from the, spray was sold to Penn Central, Penn Central was uh, 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 sold to Chiquita Banana. So yeah. I think that we actually <laughs> bought it from Chiquita Banana for a dollar, provided they could be indemnified for all of the environmental destruction that had taken place in a, in a factory that used chemicals and capacitors. Of which there were many. <laughs> so these things moved, al you know, moved along at so many different levels, uh, the level of state politics, the level of fundraising, the level of dedicated workers. But I remember at the time, I was, I believe I was chairman of the Mass Mocha Commission until 1993. Um, I actually accepted the Guggenheim position in 1986. So there were seven years. In so you did spend a lot of time in, yeah, in the mix, yeah. But in fact, part of my logic for it was that I expected that I could get Guggenheim to be a partner in Mass Mocha. Uh, because Mass Mocha didn't have a collection and didn't have art. And in fact, once I was at the Guggenheim, we did uh, persuade artists and we did uh, make loans from the, the Guggenheim collection that showed in one or two spaces what the place could be. Uh, so, you know, it always doesn't work out the way that you wanted it to, uh, to happen. But the motivation was not for this was some... I was leaving to do something else, but actually I was taking Mass Mocha along for the ride. And you kind uh, of did. With, yeah. with the Guggenheim. And it worked out for the Guggenheim slightly differently. I mean, you know, you witnessed Bilbao and the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, which is about to begin construction. So there was a lot that was going on that contributed to this uh, rather extraordinary story. Sure. Jennifer, when the governor knows the lyrics to air, <laughs> <laughs> was that a big turning point for the project because i guess at that point the boomers or close to the boomers had finally risen to a level of power that they were kind of hip to what was going on was that a big moment yeah i mean there were a couple of big moments and 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 um there were so many magical stories that i wanted to capture but certainly the one with david byrne was one of the most you know the republican governor bill weld whom I'm very fond of, um, is sort of a, you know, waspy, brown shoed. Uh, I was gonna say, not the hippest guy you've ever met. Yeah, and he was on his way to his hunting camp in the Adirondacks and he stopped by to sort of check it out. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, we, we had this very uh, interesting show by David Byrne in the unrenovated space. This is several years before the museum opened and he, uh, you know, as those who have watched the film know now that he, uh, you know, we, he, he clearly was a Talking Heads fan and that was a tipping point. And, you know, it, it just goes to show, obviously he, you know, he challenged us to raise 8 million and he raised the bar higher and higher and higher, but there are also emotions involved that you, as you know, being in the museum world, you, you know, you, you, you also support people, you support how you feel about them. And it was just, uh, yeah, it was a very whimsical moment that I was so happy to capture on film and so glad that David remembered it to, you know, sort of uh, share it with the yeah. audience. Yeah, incredible. You know, Tom, one of the things about that space, and I've been there a bunch of times, is it is freaking intimidating, that space. Are you aware of artists that have either turned the space down or not wanted to go forward? Because you walk in there and you go, oh my, and it, 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 it's almost too much. Um, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I mean, most artists um, really want to have a platform for their work. When Mass Book opened in 1999, the Gallery 5, the large gallery, that was an installation of Bob Rauschenberg's quarter mile piece. Right. That was migrating from Florida to, uh, to, to North Adams. Uh, and it was the type of project that, that certainly appealed to Bob Morris. And then, you know, the, the, I think that the real tipping point for, um, 
for Mass Mocha was uh, was Saul LeWitt in 2008. Uh, you know, that was a deal that Joe Thompson, the 30 year director of, the, of Mass Mocha was able to put together in part with uh, Saul LeWitt while he was alive, in part with Yale to whom he had he had uh, bequeathed a, uh, his his um, his collection and his, and his and his assets, and there's no way that Yale was going to show every work by Saul LeWitt, but uh, but it was at that point where it became more than a series of 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 younger artists of uh, of, of of risky perhaps exhibitions. But that Mass Mocha became a, um, that, that made, that was the moment where Mass Mocha became a real museum. Um, despite all the efforts and everybody and everything that people put into it, uh, you could look back at that and say that began uh, and it, 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 it filtered into everything else. I mean, then the quality of, uh, of the exhibitions, which was always getting stronger, um, it, it just began to move. So uh, it takes a while for these things to happen. And um, actually, I think there was one kind of like uh, controversy with an artist, but I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> well, um, well, you know, uh, Jennifer, well, Jennifer, Jennifer did. About that. Yeah. Lewitt was actually very interesting. Uh, you know, Jock Reynolds was director of the Yale Art Gallery then, and he said that we were like poor dirt farmers with a lot of land and no money. And Lewitt changed everything on, Tom's absolutely right, but on several counts. One is that Mass Mocha was like a long spine and you had to go through gallery, 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 and then you had to turn around and go back through those galleries, which was really quite anticlimactic. And the Lewitt allowed what was really part of the master plan from the beginning to create a full loop. It also allowed for a semi-permanent installation over 20 or 30 years. So, you know, it used to be that even though Mass Mocha was, you know, three times bigger than other museums will go unnamed. And anywhere, um, any place. <laughs> if, if there were a third of the galleries in transition with exhibitions, people would feel like they didn't get their money's worth. And all of a sudden, you know, there was something that was always there. And then as Tom said, it, it showed one artist in depth, which was really part of the original plan. Like if you look at the original feasibility study, it talks about that showing artists in a way that you couldn't show them any place else. So he's absolutely right. Lewitt did that. And then the Kiefer building did that. And then, you know, so each was incremental. And I think that the lesson to draw from it is that it takes time. You know, it's yeah. still a work in progress. Yeah. I also think that you have to honor the fact that people want works that they feel are theirs. You know, the Lewitz at Mass Mocha are no different than the Cezanne Bather at MoMA. You know, you're going to go yeah. there and you're going to go see that and you're going to have an emotional reaction to it because you own it in a way. You own it by virtue of the time you spent with it before. Um, you, you, you know, Jen, one of the things that stood out for me is that you use yourself in the film. And I have done that a couple of times and it drives me batty. Um, how did it feel? Was it a conscious decision? Did you... You know, are you happy with 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 that oh, decision? I I really struggled with it because I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want the film to be about me. But when when we did the first cut of it, um, I was not in it, and it felt like I had died and was watching my life. You know, like from above. And <laughs> and it's hard to take twenty eight years of your life and just discard it for the yeah, sake of not being yeah, in the film. It's, like, it's not about me. So. Um, our, the, the largest funder of the film turned to me and said, I'm gonna withdraw all my money if you don't put yourself in your own film. So- well, That made it easy. Yeah, yeah, so I did. And I think that that was the right thing to do, although hopefully I'm not in there too much. Yeah, no, no, I don't think you are too much, but you know, you're, you're, you're a big part of this. So um, Tom, do you think, um, obviously you were responsible for a phrase that circulates around the world every day, which is the Bill Bow effect. Do you think it should be called the Mass Mocha effect or the North <laughs> Adams effect? Uh, I, I think it is to a certain extent. I mean, yeah. Mass Mocha is a, re a remarkable place. I mean, you know, it, it's quite likely the largest museum of contemporary art in the world. 
<clears throat> I mean, it had happened because the factories existed, um, and the motivations in the beginning were, you know, were 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 complicated. Frankly, what I was looking for was more space to, to, to for the Ellsworth Kelly effect. As the director of the College Museum, I mean, every museum director wants more space. That was the motivation, but then that morphed into, in parallel, the. Um, uh, uh, the economic impact aspect of it, and then the political aspect of it, uh, and it became complicated. I think Mass Mocha's asset, um, it's a story that's not over. Um, you know, Jennifer referred to closing the loop. They were able to close the loop because there were so many buildings. Uh, in the beginning, they couldn't all be open. And I, I think there's still a couple of buildings at Mass Mocha that have not yet been developed, but there are also a lot more factory spaces in, uh, uh, in, in Northwest uh, Massachusetts and Berkshire County. Yeah. Um, so it only takes, um, and there's more art that can be shown. Uh, there more art exists than, than, than can be shown. And I think, you know, Joe has proven that by these successful negotiations, bringing a, a building for Ansem Kiefer and one for Saul LeWitt, uh, the biggest James Terrell installation in the world, to my knowledge, is at Mass Mocha. And it'll yeah. be there for quite a while. And I'm fr from experience, I'm telling you, when I came to the Guggenheim in 1991, I bought 10 James Terrell pieces that we never were able to show at the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, so, uh, because we didn't have the space, it was quite simply a, a function of that. So I think there's a lot, I mean, Mass Mocha is a phenomenon. Um, the film captures, uh, uh, an aspect of the phenomenon of how it came into being, but I still think that uh, uh, the, the best parts of it will continue to develop and uh, Mocha will be even more uh, because it's become, it's become a legend, actually. People know of Mass Mocha. Maybe not quite the burst of enthusiasm of, uh, of Frank Gehry and Bill Bow, but um, it's, it's along the same lines and it's close. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, there's a quote in the film by somebody that says, you can't expect art to save everything. I'm wondering how you feel about that statement. I sometimes feel art can save us all. And I'm wondering um, what role you think Mass Mocha played in saving this city? Well, I think that was a comment by Denise Marconis, who's a curator at Mass Mocha. And it was really in the response to, you know, as we alluded to earlier, some of the townspeople not being totally on board with the idea. Um, I don't know, I think looking at the pandemic, what, you know, in these really tough times, what do we derive pleasure from? We derive pleasure from music and from inspiration like films, from art, from beauty. So I think if you let it, it can save a lot. I agree. I'm wondering, there's an, uh, my friend Liz Atlan wrote in and said, how has Mass Mocha done during the pandemic? Um, and, and what are the plans going forward? Are either of you up to speed on, on how that's gone? Yeah, I'm, I'm director of another museum now. So I, I and Tracy Moore is doing a great job as the director of Mass Mocha, but I can't really comment on, you know, I mean, they're open. Um, yeah. Open is good right now. It is good. So well, I, I, there's, there, there's, there's one piece of anecdotal information that I have. I was speaking uh, with Olivier uh, Melet, the director of the Clark, and uh, he mentioned that attendance in November in 2020 was greater than it was in 2019. That's before the pandemic. Wow. So whether or not, and I, I mean, anecdotally, what I hear is that Mass Mocha has done quite well. But th then again, it's also had the capacity where most public events are reduced capacity. The one thing you have at Mass Mocha is a tremendous space. Exactly. So it, 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 it makes things like a, a crowd um, and social distancing um, easier to manage. Um, yeah, but, but I, I think that Jennifer's right. This is, um, um, it's, become a, it's become a beloved institution, um, or certainly it's on its way to becoming a beloved institution. And uh, uh, I, I still think it's, uh, its future is ahead of it. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, how's the film rolling out? Where's it going? What's it doing? Tell us about that. 
Um, it's in, uh, it's virtually in theaters across the country, uh, theaters and museums. And I'm delighted that when people buy a ticket, like you buy it at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, that half of the cost of the ticket supports the institution itself. Um, and then we have plans for, you know, which I'm, my producers are telling me I can't talk about yet, but there are future plans as well. And I, I am so thrilled. I just can't even believe it because as you said, it's my first film and I just wanted to make it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I understand completely. I, uh, I rolled out a film about Clifford Still last year that launched in March of 2020. Probably oh, wow. not the best time to launch a film, but who knows? So yeah. yeah, one of those moments. Tom, what are you working on now that you can tell us about? <laughs> we, had, we had a, a, a chat last week and you asked that question. I don't think there's enough time to talk about it, but um, it, it's a project for North Adams. And uh, I will, um, that we have very high expectations. Um, it's a, uh, you might say, the next step in the development of the museum model that we're anticipating will outdraw the current institutions by a factor of three to one. So um, <laughs> perhaps for your next, uh, your, your next uh, um, webinar, <laughs> we could have a longer discussion. Maybe Jennifer and I can make this film about that one together. I don't know. I'm kind of excited about that. <laughs> so, well, listen, I am I am proud of both of you for various reasons. I so appreciate you guys being with us tonight. You clearly created a transformative moment, Tom. And, and Jennifer, you were a big part of it and then captured it. And um, it is a real extraordinary model. Cultural districts were not a thing before this. And now... Um, my friend uh, Adrian Ellis goes around the world and talks about them every day about how to do it and what to do. And uh, it really all emanates from this moment. So I am so appreciative to both of you for spending time with our Ulite Arts audience. Well, and thanks, thanks to you for doing this. I mean, this is, a, uh, th this is an extraordinary uh, thing to have happen and it, even, even more so because of the pandemic. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Kudos to you, uh, Dennis. This is um, uh, this is uh, it was a pleasure for me to be part of it. And when uh, I heard that it was you and Jennifer, uh, uh, that 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 uh, cinched the deal. So um, I'll right. look forward to, uh, to 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 future developments of these uh, both of you filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, you, Jennifer, so much. I, I'm not going to ask you about what you're doing next because I know it's a secret. So I'm going to let it go at that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody at the Ulite audience. We appreciate okay. it. These art films are great for us. You always get to meet the director. In this case tonight, you also got to meet a guy who has been very important to my life and to the cultural uh, community in America. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. Keep paying attention. We've got some more great stuff coming. Great. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much.